This news update is brought to you by... Rock the remote with hours of free karaoke on video on demand from Flo. So bring it like Bay. There's even wonderful kids sing-alongs too, available anytime. Simply press the VOD button on your Flo remote. This is how we do TV. This is how we flow. This is the Barbados Today afternoon news update for Friday, January 29th. Thank you for joining us. I am Marie Claire Williams. Workers at the Grantley Adams International Airport are expected to begin protests at this hour over outstanding pay. Their representative, the National Union of Public Workers, had written to management requesting a favorable response by yesterday evening. The issue is over a 3.5% pay increase, which the union says dates back to 2010. The union had said that failure of management to respond would result in a protest from midday today. The chairman of the Barbados Tourism and Marketing, Inc., Alvin Gemmat, is calling for cool heads to prevail and says workers should have some patience over the matter. Gemmat warns that any industrial action at the main port of entry would be bad for the island's bread and butter industry. I hope for the absolute best. We have a country plan for the at this time. I think we've had too much of a good year in it in this business to have any type of disruption. And I am hopeful and the government's proposed $250 million cane industry restructuring project is in danger of collapsing, as a major partner is now threatening to pull out of the venture. Inter-Sugar Partnership was appointed by government in February last year to facilitate external financing for the project. But it said yesterday it would stop further funding of the multipurpose sugar factory at Andrews St. Joseph if government does not meet certain obligations by the end of June. Director of ISP Edward Marston claims government was to infuse millions of dollars as partial equity and to grant a number of concessions. But he says little has been done because, according to him, the project was not a priority. Marston is warning that unless things change within the coming months, his company would stop investing in consultancies and preparation of the old Andrews Sugar Factory site. Construction of the new state-of-the-art plant is expected to begin next year. Unless the government honors its obligations, which include financial obligations running into several millions, uh, it will not be possible to secure the external finance which is necessary to uh, enable the construction of the new factory to commence. New police stations and renovations of others are expected to begin soon under the multi-million dollar citizen security facilities project which has been launched today. In addition to building a new Hastings Worthing police station in Christchurch, the project will also see the construction of a new station and magistrate's court at Cane Garden St. Thomas, as well as repairs to the old mail barracks at the central police station. It will also involve the refurbishment of the former Black Rock police station for use as the Truth and Verification and Family Conflicts Unit. Other projects include the relocation of the police, post and welfare office to the Elaine Scantlebury home in Belle Plaine, St. Andrew, as well as a satellite office for the Department of Emergency Management. Dominica is welcoming the establishment of a new fund to help Caribbean countries meet their targets for reducing global warming. The Japan-Caribbean Climate Change Project was launched yesterday. Dominica recently had first-hand experience of the effects of climate change. The island sustained 483 million U.S. dollars in losses from the passage of Tropical Storm Erica in August. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Planning, Gloria Joseph, says they are rebuilding with the help of overseas agencies and regional neighbors. The nation's vulnerability to natural disasters and external shocks demand that we recognize the need to advance and preserve the major island concept through strategic policy actions. In this context, we see the need for preventative, adaptive, and mitigation efforts here at ensuring a sustainable economy and livelihood for all of our people. There's regional and international news after this short break.
In news from the region, Antigua and Barbuda's ambassador to the OAS, Sir Ronald Sanders, is leading a mission to Haiti today at the request of the Haitian government. The request follows the cancellation of the second round of presidential elections and the looming constitutional void which will exist when President Michel Martelly's term in office expires on February 7. The mission will assess the situation in Port-au-Prince. The polls were cancelled following street protests by opposition supporters who claimed the election would be rigged in favor of the government-backed candidate, Jovenel Moise. On the international scene, Chinese state media is reporting that four miners who had been trapped underground for 36 days have been rescued. The men were trapped by a cave-in at a gypsum mine in eastern Shandong province in December. The company's chairman drowned himself by jumping into a mine well several days after the incident. Today, China's CCTV showed footage of one of the men appearing on the surface and being taken to hospital. Seventeen people were trapped by the collapse. Four were earlier found alive, one was confirmed dead, and the fate of the others is unknown. And finally, Syria peace talks are due to get underway in Geneva amid confusion over whether opposition groups will attend. Some opposition leaders say they want an end to airstrikes and blockades by government forces. The UN envoy Stefan de Moustra has said he would open the talks by meeting with the Syrian government's delegation. We get more in this BBC. Making peace is always most difficult when no side in a war is winning or losing decisively. Despite all the bombing, even more intense since Russia started massive aerial attacks in support of President Assad last September, the battles for Syrian territory ebb and flow with no one scoring a knockout blow. Recently, Syrian government forces have claimed significant advances, including in the province of Latakia. But the large number of different forces ranged against them both rebel forces backed by Western and some Arab powers, as well as the outlawed extremists, including so-called Islamic State, make the search for negotiated peace even harder. So who'll be at the Geneva peace talks? Well, the Syrian government has promised to send a team, although it still brands all opposition rebels as terrorists. The opposition side and its international backers are far more divided. Who will appear for them and when exactly? There's been much opposition talk of boycotting the entire process. Deep disagreements involving Turkey, which insists that Kurdish representatives be excluded from the talks, and Saudi Arabia, which wants only its nominated list of organisations recognised, as well as Russian and Syrian government demands, mean that face-to-face -face talks remain a distant prospect. Finding a way to move to a ceasefire, political settlement and eventual peace looks even harder than in previous peace talks which collapsed in failure. That's the news. Remember, there's more on our website, www.barbadostoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, and like us on Facebook. We're on Izumi Media in bus terminals and screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. You can also tune in to Channel 101 on Flow TV or Mix 96.9 FM for more news and sports. I am Marika Williams. Good afternoon.